Okay, first of all, let me um, share my screen. So today, I'm going to be talking to you about um, gifts in wills and testamentary capacity, why it matters uh, to you and to your supporters. I'm then going to talk about Capacity Vault, uh, which is a tool that we can all use to stop the potential challenges to any gifts that your supporters want to leave you in their wills. Um, that is me um, and a little bit around DigiLegal, as we say, formed in 2008. We have been making testamentary documents online since then. We've just come up with a way um, of providing really best practice to protecting the wishes of people who have concerns around testamentary capacity or challenge to their will um, whilst acting either face-to-face -face or online. Capacity, I'm gonna kick off with the five W's, the who, what, why, where, when's of testamentary capacity. I'm going to start by talking to you about what testamentary capacity is, what it means from a legal perspective. Now, wills are legal documents and they will be tested against a legal set of tests and I'll explain what they are. I'm gonna talk a little bit about why that matters to you in charities, um, to any charity that could be receiving a gift in a will from a supporter. I'm gonna address the question of who should be doing something. Uh, we had a little chat with um, Carl and Tracy at the beginning. Who should be taking action to, um, to protect themselves, to protect supporters, or protect um, their families? I'm going to talk to you about where a supporter can go in order to protect their wishes, protect um, those closest to them, and to protect any charities they remember in their will. And I'm going to talk to you about when they need to take that action. It is a time critical task. So starting from the beginning, I want to talk to you about what is testamentary capacity. Um, I'm going to take you down a little journey into the deep depths of the past here. Um, in 1881, there was a case uh, we are going way back in English common, in common law history to Banks and Goodfellow um, when someone wanted to know whether uh, Mr. Banks had, uh, sorry, Mr. Goodfellow had um, Bassey when he made his will, presumably because uh, someone else would have inherited more um, if he did not have testamentary capacity. In 1881, there was a four limb test made up. Now that test was, did the person making the will have sound mind? By sound mind, what I mean is, did they know what making a will was? Did they understand the importance of signing that document in front of witnesses to make the will? Banks and Goodfellow also asked, does the person making the will have a sound memory? Do they know what they are about, do they know what assets they have, do they know what they are worth, do they know if they're a, a pauper or a prince effectively. Do they have an understanding of their own situation? Do they have sound understanding? Do they know who is around them? Do they understand their family? Do they know who their children and grandchildren are? People who might expect to inherit from their estate? Um, do they understand that? Um, and the fourth test, um, uh, some kind of maybe wording which would have been set out differently these days, but have they got any insane delusion or disorder of the mind that could poison their affections? You know, do they think um, somebody is out to get them? Um, do they, are they suffering from extreme grief? which has um, turned them against others in their family that they might not feel like if they weren't going through that process. Those are the tests that 
are used to see if somebody has testamentary capacity. It is not the tests under the Mental Capacity Act 2005. It's a shame, um, but it's the way it is. So if somebody is a um, Mental Capacity Act assessor, they won't necessarily be able to um, effectively tell if somebody has a um, testamentary capacity to make a will. And that means various things, including if somebody has intermittent um, capacity, if they um, have good days and bad days, um, they can still make a will, even if um, they don't have capacity under the 2005 Act. I want to talk to you next about why this matters. Now, first thing, I've um, chopped out a um, page from uh, BBC website from a couple of weeks ago. Discussions around testamentary capacity are going to increase. The number of people receiving dementia related diagnoses is going to increase massively. You're living in an aging population, more of your supporters are going to be um, older and more vulnerable. Um, at the same time, more people are making wills remotely. Even when you go to a solicitor, it might be done by a Zoom call or a phone call. It's not the same as sitting in a room with somebody, especially at the moment. Um, why does all this matter? Peace of mind for your supporters. When somebody makes a will, they want to know that they have set out their wishes in a way that is not going to be overturned once they have gone. Can't overemphasize the importance of the peace of mind to the people making the will. It also matters um, because of the, by addressing it, you reduce the chance of there being a challenge. You allow people to take steps to avoid a unnecessary challenge to their will when they've gone. The financial implications for everybody involved in a dispute are high. The, um, the family, the people who are not challenging the will will end up with less money because the costs of challenging will come out of the, um, of, of the estate. The financial implications to the charity are massive. Um, gifts and wills, last year's stats from, that's produced by Smee and Ford, in 2020, the average value of a will, a gift in a will to a charity was £30,000. So that is what you'll be facing losing on average. It tends to be the more valuable gifts that are challenged. So you could be looking at much more than that that the charity could lose. Um, You've also got to think about the reputational implications of there being a challenge to a will where you are the recipient of a gift. There are unfortunately certain corners of the press that delight in shining a light on legal challenges to gifts to charities um, and they don't do it with a sympathetic uh, view for the charities. I don't understand why it exists uh, and not all good publicity is good publicity. So by avoiding there being a challenge in the first place, you are doing, um, doing best by the charity that you're involved with. Who needs to be thinking about uh, testamentary capacity? I'm gonna tell you first what the law is, and I'm gonna just give a practical steer. Um, the case law that sets out who needs to be thinking about testamentary capacity and who needs to be taking action comes from 1977, uh, Ree Simpson. You don't need to remember that. You don't need to remember the case name. But I will ask you just to take a note of the judge who handed down um, this judgment, Lord Templeman. Now, what Lord Templeman said was that anybody who is elderly or aged should be taking action to protect their will. And also 
Anybody who has suffered from a serious illness should take action to protect um, their will. That is a very wide net. What is elderly? I've spoken with some practitioners. They see that as people who are over 80. I've spoken with others, and they've seen that as anybody who is retired or approaching retirement age. And I think um, <laughs> you never know. Um, you never know. Again, what is illness? What is a serious illness? Someone may have had a very serious diagnosis in their 30s or 40s, and they may have got better. Um, might have gone into remission, they might have lived a very happy life for the next 30 or 40 years before they made their will. Should they be taking um, steps because they have suffered a serious illness? We don't know and we don't have any clear guidance on it. I'm going to add a more general point about who should be thinking about testamentary capacity from a practical perspective and from a perspective that you should be um, thinking about as well as practitioners within charities. More generally, you should be thinking about whether someone making a will has a concern about there being a challenge in their will, uh, to their will, um, simply because when someone challenges a will, it's the easiest thing to say, oh yes, and they didn't have testamentary capacity because suddenly everyone has to scrabble around and try and prove that they did, which when someone is dead is extremely difficult. So from your perspective, you need to be covering everybody who may be considered as being elderly, even if they do not consider themselves as elderly themselves, everybody who has had a serious illness, even if you might not know um, that they have had an illness, but it may not be obvious at all. And anybody who may have a challenge to their will and you do not know what people's family um, backgrounds are and who might be waiting in the wings. So effectively, um, the pr only practical advice would be that everybody should be considering testamentary capacity whenever you are speaking with a supporter who wants to leave a gift in their will, you should be addressing testamentary capacity. And also let them know that it's something that is said to everybody so they don't feel singled out. Uh, because as I say, you don't know what their situation is or what they see themselves as. Oh, sorry, one more thing. If anybody who leaves a substantial gift, that's another um, important indicator of the likelihood of challenge. If someone leaves one to ten percent of um, a uh, and their estate, a challenge, unless there's another reason, is um, not substantially increase the risk of the challenge. If somebody is leaving more than ten percent, especially more than twenty percent, suddenly you dial up the likelihood of there being a challenge because the people left behind, their families are more likely to feel the need to contest that will. Testamentary capacity is almost certainly going to be one of the things that they contest it against. Um, just as a little aside about who should consider um, testamentary capacity, um, this is a cutting from a case from 2020, Goss Custard versus Templeman. Now I asked you to remember the name of the judge um, and this is that very same judge's will that was contested at court on the grounds of testamentary capacity. He made a will. It wasn't a deathbed will. He, it was seven years before he died. He may or may not have been unwell. He almost certainly would have been elderly if he was already handing down uh, judgments in 1977. Um, but nobody is immune from testamentary capacity challenge. And that just goes to show. So where can you go? What can you do about uh, testamentary capacity challenge? Back in 1977, uh, when Lord Templeman handed down his golden rule, he said that you should ensure that your will, if you are aged or you have been unwell, you should make sure that your will is signed in the presence of a medical practitioner. 
who should also take a note on the medical record. Back then, you may well have been able to do that through your GP. Nowadays, you almost certainly will not be able to do that. Um, there are notices from the Royal Colleges, um, there are uh, lots of horror stories about GPs being called into court, having to give up days and days and days of their time, being cross-examined by barristers, all very unpleasant things. Um, and you'd be very lucky to find a GP who is willing to witness a will. So go to a private doctor. Um, now, a testamentary capacity assessment from a psychologist is likely to cost you over £1,500, um, and it's very difficult to find it outside of London. You know, look, you're going to Harley Street effectively, and it costs a lot for an hour of that time. I did a trawl of the internet to find out what the cheapest way to get a testamentary capacity assessor would be, and I found it's possible to get social workers who are trained, uh, and they charge anywhere from £500, depending on where in the country you live, you have to pay for their travel uh, and it's still not cheap. It's beyond the means of most people. So that leaves Capacity Vault. Capacity Vault, I'll talk to you about it a little bit more. The cost for any of your supporters who make a Capacity Vault recording to protect their wishes is going to be £150. Anybody who is a charity partner of Make A Will Online, they'll the supporters all get that for free as part of the service. And um, wills cost £30 for a single or £40 for a pair. So now you know what actions are out there that you can take to avoid um, a challenge. Um, when should that be done? When should um, somebody be thinking about protecting their will? They should be doing it immediately before or immediately after executing their will. They should get their will drafted, get the copy, don't waste any time getting it signed and then take steps. Um, there are exceptions. If you find yourself trying to use one of these exceptions in order to get a will to be found to be valid, you are in trouble. Um, there is what lawyers call the rule in Parker versus Felgate. Again, getting our time machine to, um, to 1883. <sighs> Sorry. So um, in Parker versus Felgate, it was a very unusual circumstance. Um, Mr. Felgate went to the sisters, gave instructions when they were had capacity. The will was drafted. And in the time that it took for the solicitor to take those instructions and turn it into a will, Mr. Felgate lost uh, testamentary capacity. Um, so he showed up to sign his will. He didn't pass those tests. He did not have sound mind. He did not have sound memory. He did not have sound understanding. I don't know whether or not he had any um, insane delusional disorder of the mind. But what he did have was he could remember that he, when he gave um, instructions for this will to be drafted, uh, he remembered that he did have capacity then, and he remembered, um, uh, and then he then signed that will, even though he lacked capacity. I don't know how this became law. The judge obviously really wanted um, Felgate's will to be, uh, to be valid, and he threaded the eye of the needle to get that um, to be law. But if you find yourself relying on anything like that, you're in trouble. Um, again, when to take action. I've talked to you about when the supporter should be taking action. You should be taking action when you speak with any supporter who is considering leaving a gift in their will because only they will know their situation. So it should be, should be there. It doesn't need to be front and center, but it needs to be addressed. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, how this law is going to affect us all, um, everybody who's involved with wills or gifts in wills. Um, we did a survey of over 1,500 um, will writers and solicitors uh, about trends um, in will writing. 
we know that more wills are made remotely um, than pre-pandemic. 95% of professionals have now um, made wills remotely compared with 32% who'd taken instructions remotely before. Now, remote instructions are everything from video conferences to SMS messages. Um, we actually uh, found that 15% of, um, of, of will writers have taken instruction by SMS or WhatsApp, and that's quite terrifying. Um, uh, um, I looked at the stats for wills that were contested in 2020, um, and nine out of 10 of those wills that were contested included um, a piece about lack of testamentary capacity. Testamentary capacity is the thing which will get something into court or get something to settle because of a lack of evidence. It's not fair and um, it can now be addressed. Uh, one in 10 professionals taking instructions over WhatsApp or SMS, I mentioned that already. Um, but the, the take home from our research uh, was that 45% of people preparing wills are worried now about challenge on the grounds of testamentary capacity. Before, when people sat in a room with somebody and taken instructions, um, they would have more notes and better notes of what, the, what went on. Now, if they're ever challenged, all they'll be able to say is they were on the end, other end of a telephone call from someone giving instructions. Um, and how much can you tell about someone's testamentary capacity um, when you're not in the room with them? I would say less. So that's the, um, that's the end of the first part of my talk um, about the laws and trends in testamentary capacity. For the next 10 minutes or so, um, I'm going to talk to you about what you can do about it, about capacity vault, um, so that you can give instructions to your supporters about how they can protect their wishes. I'm going to tell you what capacity vault does. I'm going to tell you how it does it. I'm going to tell you who should be using capacity vault. Uh, and I'm going to start off by showing you a very quick uh, video. This is aimed at our solicitor partners um, as a bit of publicity. So here goes. So, capacity vault, what does it do? Um, we use a supporter's mobile phone, uh, laptop, desktop, anything with a front facing camera. Uh, we take supporters through a short tutorial, um, just explaining to them what they need to do. We record uh, their information, we store it off site securely, and then we take them through a video interview in which we ask everything a court's gonna to need to determine whether or not a supporter uh, had testamentary capacity at the point they made a will. We store it in such a way that we can produce the evidence back to the court if the will is ever challenged. Um, and we can also provide that to all the parties of the challenge. That is going to be incredibly powerful to um, avoid there ever being a dispute. We will be able to certify an original recording by using aspects of blockchain technology, um, produce that back to a court. So instead of people wondering whether somebody has testamentary capacity, the court will be able to see it for themselves. How do we do that? Ooh. Um, how do we do that? Um, user creates a secure account, enters their um, details. Uh, we verify their identity uh, by doing a number of checks, including checking against any um, credit or debit card. We record the um, location of any recording they're making, 
by using their ISPs, IP addresses, sorry, um, we take lots of information about every uh, recording that's made. Um, we access the front facing camera, as I said, um, we take them through a interview. Every single thing that is needed for a judge to determine whether someone has uh, testamentary capacity is asked. And we store that recording off site. And as I've said, we use aspects of blockchain technology to make sure that that recording is stored in a way which is tamper proof. We encrypt um, that, uh, that recording. And if we're ever called upon to, we can provide a verified um, copy, including everything that a, um, that a judge will need in order to um, make a ruling. What does that look like? Uh, I'll show you a, um, this is a, a, a test recording we did um, a couple of weeks ago, um, but it gives a sample. Um, normally a recording takes about 10 minutes. This is just a one minute sample of the information that we gather and the way that we gather uh, the information from every supporter. Please confirm your call name. Mary Smith. What is your date of birth? It's the 1st of the 3rd, um, 1952. State today's date and the time now. The 10th of January and it's 6.05 p.m. Please briefly say how you discovered capacity vote. Uh, it was recommended to me by a friend. When you learned of this service, was there any specific reason for your decision to use it? It was very clear to understand from the um, website. What would you like to achieve by using this service? Um, I would like the people in my family and friends to understand precisely what my wishes are. Okay, so that gives a, um, a bit of a taste of, of what we would provide back to the courts if a will was ever challenged. Um, who should be using Capacity Vault? I'm going to throw back to the, um, the previous part of this, um, this talk, um, reference to legal tests. Anybody who is aged or anybody who has been unwell, um, get people to err on the side of caution. If there is any chance of there being a challenge to their will, especially if they, um, there's somebody that they're not remembering in their will, they absolutely should be making a recording. Through us, it's um, through Make a Will Online, it will be done for free for them, uh, and it will save potentially tens of thousands of pounds in legal fees, or even more if the charity was to lose a, um, uh, lose a challenge. We recommend it for use we highly recommend it for use for anybody who is making wills online um, or over the telephone. We recommend it for use where people are making wills through will writers. We are partnering with will writers across the country in order for them to provide capacity vault to their clients privately. We recommend it uh, for use when people are making wills with solicitors. Again, we're partnering with solicitors firms across the country um, to bring capacity vault to their clients. Um, with the prevalence of remote wills, it is just so much safer um, to have a capacity vault recording in place. It will drastically, drastically reduce or eliminate the chance of there being a contest to the will at court because people will see for themselves what somebody's capacity is, even though they've gone. Um, and finally, any supporter that's thinking of leaving a substantial gift to you, that is anything more than a few percentage of their, um, of their residuary or anything more than a few um, thousand pounds should absolutely be protecting that with a capacity vault recording. Conclusions. Um, any will can be challenged. And when a will is challenged, it is very likely that testamentary capacity is going to be there because it is at the moment so easy to allege and so difficult to prove. Challenges, 
are always going to be disruptive. They're going to be disruptive for you as a charity trying to manage your income. It's they're going to cause delays to income at best. Uh, it's going to cause time loss to you at best. At worst, it will cost you the legal fees and the cost of the um, uh, and the cost of the gift. Um, to the family, of course, it's going to the testamentary capacity challenges cause enormous upset. Um, historically, capacity assessments are very difficult, impossible to get, or very expensive. Um, that's not the case anymore. The concerns are there for all wills, but now that people are um, preparing wills remotely, uh, it's even worse. You know, with that Templeman case, he signed his will six years before he died in front of a solicitor, and it still got to court as a challenge. Now, you can offer Capacity Vault to protect your supporters' chat wishes um, across the board. So that's the end of my um, you know, structured part of my um, talk. I can see there's something in the chat. I'll get to that in just a second. But before I address those, if you want to get in touch to talk about anything um, that we've addressed in the course of this seminar, pick up the phone, have a chat with me, give me an email, or you can contact um, contact Marie at partnerships at makeawillonline.co.uk. Um, but otherwise, um, has anybody got any questions? Um, bu -bu 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 -bum. So Debbie has asked uh, whether evidence captured by Capacity Vault has been used in any cases. Um, so in a word, no, uh, Debbie, the, um, the reasons we don't, and the reason it's very unlikely that anything with a capacity vault recording is ever going to get to court is because of the strength of the evidence. People only take cases to court where there is a chance of success. If you are saying somebody does not have testamentary capacity and they've got a 15 minute long recording, recording everything that they need to, um, to show to prove testamentary capacity, that will never get to court because no insurer, no, um, no underwriter for the legal expenses will ever get involved. Um, the other reason that nothing's got to court yet is because um, there is not a, um, it was launched in January and um, typically um, cases take, uh, I don't know, uh, two, three, four years to get to court. What we have done to mitigate risk is to get the um, to, well, get the best um, best legal advice possible during the creation um, of, the, of the capacity vault um, system. The um, we used in particular Lee Sagar. He is um, on the Global um, Society of Trust and Estates um, Practitioners Steering Committee on technology and on um, capacity issues. He's a barrister with um, over 30 years experience and he straddles the area between technology and um, wills um, and has done specialised in that for most of his career. So we've taken the very best um, advice on and made sure that um, the team includes that kind of legal mind. So thank you, Debbie. Has anybody else got any questions um, about this? Please feel free just to unmute yourself or to stick something in the chat if you'd rather. Hi, I've got a question, um, Trisha Richards. Um, okay. Hi, um, I just wanted to know, and I'm sure that you've got really good uh, evidence, but how can you tell if the person you're actually talking to is the person that's the will right and the, the person who's the as is writing the will yep. that's what i mean so the identity just because if they're remote it might be very difficult in knowing that that is the real person because it could be somebody else doing it on behalf or yeah absolutely so there'll be a, a 15 minute long video of that person talking um to camera uh so over the course of 15 minutes if some if there's an impersonator it's likely that would come to light. Um, there will be audio recordings um, and it's now possible. I don't know if, whether you know that when you're speaking, I don't know if you bank with somebody who has um, voice um, identification when you log in. 
if you want to try handing your phone to somebody and um, giving your phone to someone else during a conversation with the bank, they all know within seconds that it's no longer you because of the um, vocal patterns. So that technology can be applied retrospectively to recordings to verify somebody. We get the um, we get a uh, information on where they're calling from. So we don't just record the information that they give us through their front facing camera. We also get the um, IP address that they're contacting us from. We also um, get the information, all the information from the credit card. So we can try and give it, we get a lot of data points, including um, audio visual of them. If somebody tries to go in and deep fake later on, um, we will know about it because of the way that we have stored the information. Um, if anything, nothing can happen to the recordings because they're stored and encrypted off-site um, and held in you know, the highest level of security that's possible. Um, if something were, then we would know because of those aspects of the blockchain technology we use in storing the, um, the videos. So we've covered it from a kind of hacking angle. We've covered um, from a, um, you know, somebody recording something, not from the, um, not from the, uh, supporters device or you know if, if it's um if somebody in a different town is recording we'll be able to identify it there's lots of ways that we can prove the originality okay and i don't know the details because i'm not sort of a uh, um i'm not the tech person but i had we had thought through was there anything else that you thought that any other mischief that you thought could someone could do in order to um fake a recording no, just because obviously wills are always contested like you just said um and there's lots of fraudulent stuff that goes on with wills as well pre pre and post so um it was just an interesting one because the other thing is that if you've got somebody that sat there's very vulnerable in front of a screen and you've got some behind the screen holding up this is what you're going to say i know it sounds that's like a bit far-fetched no, no, but, that's, you know. that's true we, we thought of that as well it, it could happen. It's very unlikely that yeah. somebody who was trying to pursue a fraud would want to gather that kind of information um, through Capacity Vault because it is very obvious when someone's looking away from the camera, away from the device that they're recording on. Um, we the, the chance of there being an undue influence challenge to a will with a Capacity Vault recording are drastically reduced. Same for fraud simply because during the course of the recording, the supporter is asked who they're remembering, who they're not going to remember. Um, and they will say in their own words um, who they don't want to, um, who they don't want to include and who they do. Tying all of that in is going to be extraordinarily difficult for someone with criminal intent. There's always one though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, 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 there may well be, but I would be. Oh, no, um, just... they, they they wouldn't be using a capacity vault recording to um to, to they they just wouldn't. It would just be very good evidence that they are doing something very it's a, wrong. It's a good. It's a it's a really good system actually. I'm quite impressed. Um, and I do think that you know, like you say, in the future, because people don't have time to go and sit in solicitors' offices or wills, uh, you know, physically, and it is all online. So actually having evidence of somebody speaking and saying exactly what they wanted at the time when they actually wrote their will um, makes a hell of a lot of sense than um, sifting through a thousand bits of paper that possibly weren't signed or weren't delivered or whatever else or the person's um, capacity wasn't that good. So um, no, it's good, good product. Thank you very much indeed. All right. Thank you. I don't think we've got, we've got no more questions in chat. Yeah, no, no, no more questions in the chat. No, no more questions in the chat. So I think that's, um, that's it. Thank you very much indeed to everybody for coming. I think we um, hit the um, 45 minutes now. So if anybody has any questions they don't want to share with the room, um, feel free to stay behind. Otherwise, I'd just like to say a, a really big thank you for everyone coming on, for coming along. 
we'll drop you an email. Um, it'd be very helpful if you could um, let us have the feedback forms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and um, all the very best um, going forward, getting gifts in wills for your charities. Many thanks indeed. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Really useful. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. I think that's it. I'm going to end the recording. So, okay. Uh, cheers, Marie. Cheers. Bye.